Why is this day good? How could we call a day when we are forced to confront our human capacity for violence, betrayal, and cowardice? A day that results in the excruciating death of an innocent man? A man that is also God's own self? How could that possibly be called good? I have one answer, and I'll get to that in a second but I still choke on the word good as applied to this day. It's sickening what happened and what God made of it doesn't take away the stench of it for me completely. I think it would be helpful to tell you up front that I'm not one of those people who thinks that Jesus had to die. I'd like to think that someone in that sad chain of events could have chosen differently. Pilate could have listened to his wife or acted on his own hunch that Jesus was being falsely accused and set him free. The crowd could have asked for Jesus to be released instead of Barabbas. Or the disciples could have defended Jesus in that sham trial. Nicodemus could have spoken favorably to his fellow religious leaders about Jesus's prophetic ministry. What if the Roman soldiers had just not gone along with the plan? What if the bystanders had revolted? When you think of it, it's so many things. Individual cowardice and betrayal, for sure. But also the government, government's use of violence to maintain order. And things that modern psychologists and sociologists would recognize as our propensity to project our fears onto something else and then hate that very thing in it. Or what happens when a mob turns violent? There are so many things, so many sad, ugly things on the part of individuals and also institutions and systems and whole cultures that directly conspire to kill Jesus. There may or may not be some other big thing at work here, a cosmic struggle between the powers of life and death. But what is clear to me is that humanity itself, writ both small and large, is directly complicit in Jesus's crucifixion. So how could this day be good? I promised my answer. And this is just one answer. And there are many more different answers and people have been arguing about this for almost 2000 years. But what touches me, what gives me faith and hope is that even though humanity itself, both small and large, was directly complicit in, in Jesus's crucifixion, God absorbed all that hate and violence and cowardice and mob mentality and bystander apathy and the psychological patterns that protect us from seeing our own complicity and evil. He took the worst we could possibly do, including our own self-deceptive, self-righteous anger, and he absorbed it into himself and loved us anyway. This reminds me of a toddler in full tantrum, kicking, screaming, punching, doing no harm at all to her mother who waits patiently for the anger to subside, calming her and loving her and protecting her from harm. As a human species, we rage, we cry, we punch, we kick, we lash out, red-faced, self-righteous, blind to our own faults. And God absorbs it, all of it. And instead of destroying us then and there with thunderbolts or turning us into pillars of salt, God absorbs all this hate and violence, even to God's own death. The heartbreak of this day, the thing we do not like to see, the thing that we will do and say and think almost anything to avoid is that after our burst of violence, 
when we are left sweaty and red faced to look at what we've done, that is agony. But I haven't done anything. That story was in the past. I can hear myself say that. Or, oh, I would have defended him. I would have spoken up or stood with him or shut the whole thing down or I would have done something. We say to ourselves, but take a cold, hard, unflinching look. It was individual cowardice and betrayal that killed Jesus, but also institution and systemic factors, psychological and sociological phenomena, self-delusion, apathy, bigotry, fear, lust for power, all things we see around us today. 10 months ago, I stood just a few miles from here on the patio of St. John's Lafayette Square, along with thousands of other people protesting the murder of George Floyd and so many others at the hands of police. And then I watched, I watched police dressed for war turn that sacred ground into a battleground with tear gas, flash grenades, and rubber-tipped bullets as they beat, fired on, and terrorized innocent people. We've been witness this week to the sickening story of George Floyd's death in the trial of the officer who killed him. When I heard of the testimony of Darnella Frazier, the courageous 17-year-old girl whose video of George Floyd's death rocked the world, or Genevieve Hansen, the off-duty firefighter and EMT who begged the officers on site to let her tend to George Floyd as he cried out and lost consciousness. When I thought of those women, I thought of the women at the foot of the cross, bearing witness to Jesus's suffering and death. When the police officers on the scene did nothing, as George Floyd gasped for air and cried out, I can't breathe, I thought of Judas and Pilate and the many instances of individual cowardice and betrayal. Or I thought of the mob shouting, crucify him. George Floyd's neck was pinned to the asphalt with a knee instead of nails. But make no mistake, institutional racism and the systemic projection of criminality and danger onto black bodies. The evil that so many of us have refused to see or believe, that evil is now forever splayed out before us hanging in the air like Jesus on the cross. Look at what we have done. Bear witness to the suffering and violence we have wrought. Look without flinching at centuries of lynchings and enslavement and oppression and Jim Crow laws and the criminalization of black bodies. Look at the renewed fervor to disenfranchise black and brown voters in Georgia and around the country. Look at George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Freddie Gray and Sandra Bland and Michael Brown and so many others say their names, Jesus dwelt in them. So how is this good news? This is a gut-wrenching picture so far, who we are, what we're capable of back then and now. With what we've done to other human beings, children of God, every one of them. What is good about this day? That God loves us anyway even today, that God willingly absorbed all that stuff, the anger, 
the fear, the projection, the ignorance, the cowardice, the apathy, all of it. God stretched out God's arms on that cross and took it all and loves us anyway. We know that because God has told us repeatedly and because the resurrection affirms it. But there is still one more thing for me to say. I can't know for sure, but I suspect God was hoping that once we saw what we had done, when finally exhausted and red-faced and sweaty, we looked up and saw that we had killed him, that we would be changed, that we would finally, once and for all, learn to really love one another following in the loving ways of Jesus. To be honest, it breaks my heart to think that God might have hoped this for us because we're still crucifying each other every day. But I have hope that if we can just stare unflinchingly at what we have wrought, not just skimming over past the wretched parts to congratulate ourselves on how far we've come, but if we can see the truth of what we've done to others and to ourselves, the truth of what each one of us as individuals and as a society are capable of, if we can stare at that ourselves, then maybe that pain can soften our hearts and transform us into the people God made us to be. Until then, and always, God loves us anyway. And that is, frankly, incredible.